a few weeks ago, I was on this weekend trip with my man group. And this man group is really special because we meet once a month, get together, and do really crazy stuff, like talking about our feelings <laughs> or <laughs> meditations. And on this weekend trip, we attended a little workshop, and there I learned this. Tevaka! This is part of a haka, and a haka is a ritual dance of the Maori. The Maori are the indigenous people of New Zealand. And in their language, tevaka means, well, actually, three things. First of all, it means, I am. Then it means, we are. And thirdly, it means, the canoe. You have to know, these people, they built canoes that held like 30 to 40 persons, and with many of those, they travel across the oceans and conquer new worlds. So what they are saying is, I am. I take a stand. But also, I have a place in the we, in the us. And we are all in the same boat. We live in the same world, on the same planet. And doing this for almost two hours, it was so grounding and centering. It came natural to feel authentic. But in my day-to-day -day life, it's different. With all that distraction going on, and I don't mean just outside, also in here, all these different voices. I mean, is it just me or do you know this? Like, have the cake, not have the cake, anybody? Have those voices? Heard of them? Yeah. Like, I'm in this business meeting. There's this guy. He, he's a prospect. I want to acquire him as a customer. And, and he's a multiplier for me, so kind of important. Though I'm talking to him, and one of my voices comes up. What are we doing here? Well, we're doing business. At least we're trying to. You know, if you let us. But we don't like the guy. <laughs> we don't have to like him, we just have to convince him. And then he places the order and we make some good money and then we can spend time with people we like. I don't like it. <laughs> and if that wasn't enough, a third guy comes up. Can we just have sex? <laughs> so, so, how is this supposed to work? Which one of these voices is my true, authentic me? Well, the answer is none of them. And all of them. The true, authentic me is the guy having all these voices in his head. And the worst mistake you can do is try to ignore one, or try to shut it out, get rid of it, or even just to hide it from the outside world. You lose your authenticity right then and there. And believe me, I tried. I learned the hard way. Because when that third guy came up to me the first time, like ever, Imagine the local pool not being filled with water, but with Nivea cream. <laughs> you know, that thick stuff that comes in the blue cans? And then we go in there and we immerse. Oh, wouldn't that feel great? And then, you know, the kindergarten teacher, the one, she would be there too with us, and we're both naked. <laughs> and I was like, whoa. Yeah, probably would feel good, but, but I was confused. <laughs> At the time, I was only five years old. <laughs> I, I, 
I didn't know what to make of this, that I had my first sexual fantasy. And besides, I didn't like that kindergarten teacher, you know? I kind of hated her. She was mean to me. So that was even more confusing. And on top of that, I looked around me. My peers, they didn't talk about stuff like this. My parents didn't either. So I figured this is nothing to talk about. It's probably just happening to me. So I'll keep it you know, away from the outside world. And that's where I created this little gap from what's going on inside of me and what I put out to the world. And I started my inauthenticity. And of course, when I grew up and my peers grew up, I realized they were exploring their sexuality. You know, it started with a little bo bottle twisting stuff and, and, and then the close dancing on parties. And, and I was terrified of all of that because I had decided, no, I, I'm not even admitting that something like that is going on. It's like, no, not me. I don't have this. I, have, I don't have any desires. Or, no, no, no. So when they you know, got older and, and had first relationships and kissed and, and, and I could imagine there was more going on, I was locked out. Well, basically, I had locked myself in. Into my own prison of not being authentic. And this went on until like 11th grade. This girl comes into my life. She was from a parallel class and, and so in 11th grade, this was all mixed, and, and I got to know her better, and she was just great. Her brown hair, big brown eyes, full lips, very feminine body already, and so outgoing, lively, and, and laughing a lot. And, and when I said bye to my gang at school, you know, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm leaving, and she would come up, oh, Marcus, bye, and give me a kiss, sometimes even on the lips. It was amazing. And shortly afterwards, I had to move to the States. My parents were going there for two years. And of course, I went with them. And well, that was a good thing, actually, because I, I really grew from that experience. My self-esteem grew. And whenever I was back in Germany for little visits, I made sure I contacted her. And, and we met, and I told her about the States. You know, I never admitted any like man, woman, sexual tension interest, but at least I, I talked to her. And about three months before we had to move back to Germany from the States, she calls me up. Marcus, I did it. You got me so inspired about the States, I applied for an au pair job, you know, and I got one. And you know what? It's near Boston, where you are. I'm like, whoa. And my family, they, they're going you know, on a vacation with a child, so I don't have any work. And I was thinking, maybe, maybe I could stay with you a couple of weeks? Uh, yes, yes, <laughs> I did say yes. And this was going to be great. I knew with her being so outgoing, me you know, being able to show her everything, knowing the language. And, and so I planned it, you know, go out with my buddies and party and, and show all the great stuff I learned, like where to get the best junk food and, and how to smoke pot and, and drinking games, you know. And, oh, and then she came and unfortunately, she was a little sick. She had this infection of her bone on the ribs and it gave her quite some pain. So even though she wanted to, she couldn't really go out. It was just, she was just sick and we're just taking care of her and that was fine. But of course, you know, that, that wasn't what I expected. And then she even got a fever. And my mother was like, well, you know, with a fever, let's check it out in the hospital. And we did. We went there and they checked it out and they made an x-ray. And on the x-ray, something weird showed up. And the doctor said, you know, it is safe for her to travel. And it would be a good idea for her to be with her family back home. Take care of that. And we knew something was up. And we got her home. And about four weeks later, her mother calls my mother. And when I came home, 
She told me she had bone cancer. And she was already dead. So I was devastated. I mean, that pain of losing her to cancer and also losing with her that hope of closing this huge gap that, that, that had grown. I didn't know what to do. The only idea I had was trying to fill that gap with alcohol. And actually, that did give me glimpses of how it felt to be in the moment. I had times, every once in a while, where I was really there, accepting my life, myself, and being in the moment. And that's where I realized where I wanted to be. And of course, buying that with alcohol, that was like a, like a prison leave, you know, like a temporary thing. And one night, when I was at the point where, where I was feeling like, oh, it's enough now, I tanked enough, you know, to feel loose and relaxed and, and enjoy, the next morning I realized that was the last thing I remembered of the night. Blackout after that. So alcohol wouldn't work anymore. I needed so much to have fun that I forgot the fun that came. So I needed to do something different, and I did. I started smoking pot like crazy. And one day, I had this notion of figuring out how much do I actually smoke. One of my inner voices tricked me into that. And I had a piece of paper and a pencil, and I was sitting there. Whenever I finished the joint, I made a tick mark. And after like five tick marks, I was wondering, did I do this right? Did I maybe double tick mark a joint? Because, you know, and I was smoking it, and when I put it, put it out, and I don't want to have wrong numbers here, right? <laughs> so, so luckily, I remembered I cleaned the ashtray in the morning, so I only had to count the butts, and I did. I counted the butts, the tick marks, matched them up, and was confused again because I was holding a joint in my hand. Should I tick mark this or not? I'm not sure. Did I have a rule? I don't remember. You know, cannabis, short-term memory. Well, long story short, in the evening, one more time, I counted all the butts in the ashtray, and the number was an astonishing 16. And I had only started that day at 3 in the afternoon. And of course, you can imagine, you know, I was a professional. Those weren't like baby joints. Regular people took two hits of this, went to have a seat, stared happily at the ceiling, and didn't move for two hours. And I smoked 16 of those babies all by myself on a regular day. So I had this little inner dialogue, and we agreed it was too much. And now I needed to find a real new way to deal with this, not just distract myself. And I did. My way out was talking. I went out into the world and slowly started talking to close friends, therapists, not so close friends, female friends. And one day, I talked to this girl. I, I only met her a few times at a friend's house, and, and I just put up all my courage, and, and I said to her, I'm kind of interested in you, and, and I don't mean just on a friendship basis. I was like, what's going to happen now? And she was really nice about it. She said, oh, okay, cool. Unexpectedly. And this was the beginning of my first relationship at age 33. And it lasted two years. And after that, another one, 10 months. That was really crazy and weird, but I learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then after that, another one. And that's been going on for over 15 years. We have two kids and are still going strong. So. I talked to the third guy. Man, this is great. We have the regular sex. We have two kids. <laughs> but remember, first time we ever met? But the immersion? <laughs> and I don't mean the cream stuff, but I want to explore. I mean, I want to go deep. This is such a big thing, sexuality. I mean, the possibilities, tantra, slow sex, 
and all the stuff I didn't even hear about yet. I want it. This is important to me. Well, I knew one thing. I'm not going back into prison. So I kept at it. And when the email arrived from this friend of mine and my wife, who's writing books, actually, on like G-Point and Tantra and, and coaching couples on sexuality. And she wrote, I met this amazing photographer. She's doing in intimate photos of couples having sex. And since I'm building this online course on slow sex, I want a couple to have photos taken and I, I can use them for the course. Who's up? I was reading this and my third guy was like, you know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. I had to uh, tell my wife that I would actually, you know, want to try this. And I went to her and said, you see the email? And, you know, I, th I think it's kind of uh, intriguing. And actually, you know, I, 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 I tried, maybe. And I was like, okay, she's not going to, you know, leave me for that. So she looks at it and it's like, yeah, you're right. Sounds interesting. Let's do it. What the hell? <laughs> so I couldn't pull back now. We set it all up, and yes, we, we went there, and, and we got naked and, and had sex. And yes, it was completely awkward and weird, and, and, and we did it because we knew afterwards we would feel like heroes. And photographer did the photos, and afterwards we felt like shit. <laughs> what happened? Well, gaps came up again. I mean, I, for my part, first of all, I tried to completely ignore that there was somebody else in the room. And it was kind of rough, you know, having sex, and then there are like these feet next to your wife's head, you know, all of a sudden. It didn't really work. <laughs> and the next thing was like, I, I felt my wife being tense and not really letting go, but I didn't address it. Gap. I didn't bring it out. And then I felt a little bit rejected by that, and I didn't bring that out. I just pretended oh, I'm the patient, understanding guy here, you know, I'll just take time, I give her time, I caress her a little more, and this is, you know, I'm, no, I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I'm not impatient, and I was. And my wife had similar stuff. She had her inner conflict about, you know, what she wanted to do and didn't want because of the camera, and, and so this was going on, though we both had inner conflicts. And, and, and soon we had an outer conflict with each other and blaming each other. And, well, we had some practice in talking about it. And also we called that friend of ours that got us into this mess in the first place. And we talked to her and to the photographer and we put it all out. We closed the gaps again. We came to the place where it was all there. And then we could relax and be our authentic selves. And the next day we did first those posing photos. And it went great. We were relaxed. That wasn't like hot, steamy sex stuff. And we joked around with the photographer. And after that was all done, I was sitting there, and my wife was sitting right in front of me on the bed. And she was looking at me. And her eyes were beaming. She was so beautiful. I fell in love with her again right then and there. And that feeling swept through me. And she felt the same, and then we really engaged in free, intimate sex and acknowledged that there was somebody else in the room. We even talked to the photographer in the not-so-hot phases. And yes, after that, we felt like heroes. It was so liberating. We had become comfortable at being authentic, even in that situation. It was amazing, and what else happened was, I let go. I realized I was carrying around this feeling of being inadequate, of having a deficiency when it came to sexuality. But in that moment, I realized it's time to let that go. I looked around when we were in the city, and, and I realized, well, most of these people haven't done this, what well, we just did, and most probably never will. So it's time to let that go. Now, 
What have I learned from all of this? The hard way? The long and hard way about authenticity? Well, it's three big things. The first one is, it doesn't just happen to you. You need to get active. You have to do something. You have to face your fears and go through them. And yes, that means showing up vulnerable and really taking that risk. And that leads me to the second learning. It's worth it. When you do that, when you're really there, these little things happen that are almost like magic. The way you can connect to people when you really show up as yourself, to the people that are relevant to you, is amazing. Like, I have this client, Brian, from Ireland, and he wants to go out, and I'm, I'm in a one-on-one -on -one coaching intensively with him via Zoom these days. He wants to bring his story out, and he has this backstory where he was like 18 and wanted to be on stage already, and he got this little part at a Shakespearean company. They gave him a little tiny role, and on opening night, he's on the stage, and he's like, Confused. What are, what are my cues? What are my lines? And then, then he's like, oh, fuck. And then he realized he just said fuck in the Shakespearean play on stage. <laughs> and he's like, fuck. And then he was like, oh, this is bad. Fuck. And he ran off stage. <laughs> yeah. And when I tell it, it's funny. When he told it, I said to him, well, you're just reporting on this. You're not there. You have to be there, you have to feel it. Whatever comes up, doesn't matter. But you being reporting on it and trying to make it funny, that's not it. So he looks at me, or at the camera, but he's like, Marcus, I'm not sure I want to go there. And I'm like, Brian, that's where it's at. Trust me, it's safe. Go there. And he did. And he moved me to tears with this story that I had heard many times before. Because when you really show up with what's up, it resonates. It's incredible. So that's the second learning. It's worth it. And the third one is, it's never over. This is something you have to do, like brushing your teeth. You don't brush your teeth once and then they're clean, and that's that. No, you do it every day, again and again. So if you want to show up authentically, it's a four-step process. First, acknowledge. Acknowledge all the voices inside of you. No pushing out, no pushing away, no hiding. And if you need tools, find them. Find meditation, mindfulness, whatever works for you to hear those voices and to acknowledge them and to integrate them. Step number two, show up in the world with all those voices present. Dare to be personal and get in real contact with yourself and others. And the third step is get a sense of when you are not true to yourself. That's a certain feeling. If you get a sense for it, you can recognize it. And it's not about all the voices going out directly all the time. But don't use that as an excuse for not being true to yourself in situations where you know exactly that this should be on the table. That's what I mean. Get a sense for when you're doing that. And then comes step number four. Go back to step one. Acknowledge. Acknowledge that you weren't true to yourself and then show up with that in the world. And I promise you, if you do this over and over again, your life will change. It will be much more fulfilled. 
you can't even fail anymore. Because if you do that, actually, when you listen to all your voices, you're following your heart. And then it's just your journey. And you can't fail on that. It's just steps. Your close ones will benefit from you showing up for real. And those relationships will benefit. Your business will benefit. Imagine all those relationships with your employees, your, your colleagues, your partners, but also with your prospects and your clients. It's amazing to have clients become your friends. And you know what else is going to benefit? This planet. If we're not going for distracting ourselves or even building a business on distracting others and catering to their urge to do that, we're going to save so much resources. So please, go within. Listen to your heart. And then show up like this in the world and take your stand. Thank you.